like in the bottom of the PowerPoint, there's an option where you can just put it on you know, presentation mode. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That was very good. Okay, cool. Thank you. So, good morning, everybody. I'm Paula Mead, a fellow at the laboratory with Dr. Q. Today, I'm going to present a case of a left medial sphenoid, sphenoid wing meningioma um, that was operated on last week by Dr. De Almeida and Dr. Quinones Hinojosa. Uh, thank you, Dr. De Almeida, for all your help with this presentation. And this is just a picture of the neurosurgery building at the Mayo Clinic for all those who are visiting from other parts of the world. So the case presentation, we have a 44-year-old female patient with a past medical history that is remarkable for beta thalassemia, anemia, and multiple sclerosis. Uh, the multiple sclerosis um, history is important because she was diagnosed um, in 2013. She had some intermittent word finding difficulty. She also presented uh, with optic neuri neuritis in a couple of times, and she suffered also from feet paresthesias. She moved from elsewhere to uh, Florida, and she went to Mayo Clinic Florida to um, the neurology clinic uh, for, for a follow-up as she was having some symptoms, and the neurologist ordered a new MRI. And this is, are the images, just for, for reference, these are the images from 2014 when she was first diagnosed. Oh, yeah. Sorry, did somebody say something? When she was first diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, you can see in the T1, well, it's not pretty evident, but she had some demyelinating um, um, lesions. However, it, otherwise it was, the, the um, MRI was normal. However, uh, when she was here and the neurologist wanted to follow up um, on her disease, they found this extra axial lesion that is iso intense in T1 that is located in the medial left sphenoid wing and is hyper intense in T2. It, it was most consistently with the meningioma and importantly, it was encasing the M1 segment of the MCA, and it was also in contact with the ICA and pushing the, the left cavernous sinus. It did not appear to go into the optic canal, which is important. However, it was uh, it, it was described and read by our, neurodi uh, our, our radiologist that it was push pushing the optic nerve. And it, was also, it also had some effacement of the temporal uh, temporal horn of the lateral left lateral ventricle as you can see here that's the mca in the t2 axial i don't know if uh dr gupta wanted to comment on this lesion no i mean i mean you've essentially sort of described it it seems to be attached to parts of the sphenoid wing and ridge and then extending over to the clinoid process the lateral surface of lateral and superior surface of the anterior clinoid and these tend to extend into the sullivan fissure, as you've seen here. And they either push the MCA or they can sort of go around the MCA. And that may make them surgically challenging. Uh, it's And then to be able to see the extension into the optic, as you can see that it is sort of turning around along the medial surface a little bit of the anterior clinoid process. So it does have the, the trajectory if it keeps growing to grow into the optic canal. But of course, uh, it probably does not at this point. And there it can sort of inferomedially push the optic nerve. Uh, so it's gonna be in contact or close contact with the optic nerve at this stage. Thank you, sir. So at this moment, uh, Dr. Q recommended surgery because of the uh, relationship with the vessels. However, the patient for personal reasons, she decided to um, observe the lesion and do not go uh, undergo surgery in 2020. However, she did see ophthalmology, sorry, um, who Dr. Edinburgh said that the lesion is likely asymptomatic and but continued growth could uh, alter visual function. 
And so this uh, case was a little bit tricky because the patient was having some visual um, symptoms because of the of the diagnosis of, of multiple sclerosis, but because of the inter intermittent nature of the lesions of the symptoms, these were associated more with the um, MS instead of the tumor. Then in 2022, she came back um, for his follow for her follow up. Um, she did present presented with more headaches, nothing um, major. And she was basically neurologically intact. Uh, the, the ophthalmology exam was um, uh, the same, basically. However, in the images, the tumor was some millimeters. It was read as stable, but it was some millimeters larger than the MRI that was taken in 2020. This one, this one is from October of 2021. And as you can see, you can see the same um, lesion characteristics uh, as on the previous one. And we did not have uh, contrast enhancing uh, images as the patient thought that she was allergic. However, at this time we did get, and we can see that it is homogeneously, enha uh, homogeneously enhancing and is most consistent with a uh, left medial sphenoid wind meningioma. And in the screenshots on the right, I wanted to show the relationship it had with the, IC, the, the ICA and the MCA, the M1 segment of the MCA. And as you can see, the tumor is basically uh, surrounding the, the vessel and is very in close contact with the left cavernous sinus. Uh, Dr. Gupta, would you like to add something else? No, I mean, it seems that both on the coronal and axial sections, it seems to be going around the carotid summit and the adjacent MCA. So. I mean, obviously there is sort of near complete uh, sort of uh, call, call it encasement or whatever. It is just sort of surrounding the artery uh, pretty much on all sides. Yeah. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Dave Yomita here. So a beautiful image is a very nice presentation so far. Uh, the images selected are very nice because with, with those uh, you know, details, those features of the tumor basically arising from the medial sphenoid wing, lateral wall, the cavernous sinus, and the lateral aspect of the clinoid. We had to develop a surgical plan with the goal of preserving the vision of this patient in the near future. She is a 44 years old, extremely, you know, health, overall healthy uh, mother of three children. And uh, after discussion, we decided for surgery. In terms of the decision for surgery, we looked at uh, proximity with the left optic canal, the relationship with the clinoidal segment and supraclinoidal segment of the carotid, and uh, and also the anterior clinoid process as well as MCA. I'm sorry, Paula. I see that you have a slide for that. <laughs> go, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, as Dr. De Almeida said, the indication for the surgery is the tumor growth over the last six years, as the tumor wasn't identified, or it was very minor in the images in 2014. Honestly, I couldn't see it. Um, and the relationship with the vessels and the left opti optic nerve, as Dr. Uh, Almeida said. So the plan was to do a left pretemporal approach with, extradural, with an extradural anterior clinoidectomy for resection of the tumor, with the main goal of obtaining tissue for diagnosis, even though it is pretty evident that we're dealing with a case of a meningioma, but it's very important to always have um, a diagnosis from pathology and also to obtain a maximum safe, safe resection. As Dr. De Almeida said, uh, the main objective was to take care of the vessels and the left optic nerve. So right now I'm going to do, I'm, I'm yeah. going to play the, the operative video. Uh, if I may say just, just one comment, Paula. So looking at all those anatomical details, we, we envision that uh, to proceed with the left pretemporal with then extradural uh, middle fossil filling, uh, exposure of the anterior clinoid extradurally, then drilling up the extradural clinoid with, with exposure of the optic canal. And only after that, then opening the dura, uh, finding and dissecting the tumor away from the optic nerve dissecting the tumor away from the uh, subclinoid or ICA, and then dissecting the M3 branches of the MCA to have proximal distal control of the vessels would allow us then to maximize control. And then lastly, 
to remove any residual uh, cells attached to the dura in the base of the skull and also lateral decavern of sinus. So overall, that was the plan and Paul has the video to, to highlight some of those steps. So um, the patient was taken to the OR and she was positioned supine. Uh, general endotracheal anesthesia was carried out. And I'm gonna ask for help from Dr. De Almeida as this was a very anatomical surgery and he did some beautiful dissections. Yeah, so here we basically did a left frontotemporal uh, incision. You see the the first layer, the skin plane, uh, the skin mobilized forward, then dissecting the STA branches. And there I was just trying to find the zygomatic arch. I mean, the dorsal root of the zygoma. After that was done, after the dorsal root is exposed, then I, I'm one centimeter behind the keyhole point, our frontal zygomatic suture. Then we proceeded with interfascial dissection and the superior layer of the temporalis fascia is mobilized forward in order to protect the temporal, uh, frontal temporal branches of the facial nerve and also to allow us the correct planar dissection for the zygomatic process of the frontal bone and also exposure of the dorsal root of the zygoma. So we didn't do a uh, orthozygomatic approach, but we wanted to have a maximum exposure. So you saw there just preserving the pericranium flap, mobilizing the temporalis muscle down. So you see muscle down, skin forward. And then the burr holes, as usual, for this uh, pretemporal or extended terrional approach that will give us further access to the middle pass and also temporal pole. So the bore holes were placed below the superior temporal line just for cosmesis afterwards. And then everything else was drilling. So we drilled a lot until we got flush with the middle fossa, dissected the dural way from the trio fossa orbital roof. And once again, drilled uh, all the way until we got everything flush with anterior fossa, middle fossa. After that was completed, we worked under the microscope and you see the hyperostatic bone uh, at the anterior clinoid process on the left side, working with a two millimeter diamond drill uh, and three millimeter diamond drill. We went ahead and uh, continued the drilling the, the clinoid from lateral to medial because of the degree of hyperostatism. And then we drew all the way to the optic canal. And then once we found the optic canal and uh, basically removed the bone from the optic canal, drilled towards the optic strut. And then you see here with a rotor number three dissected the clinoid, the remaining clinoid away from the clinoid segment of the carotid and uh, the roof of the cavern sinus. So the extra drill work was completed and then we proceeded with opening of the dura. I don't know that, a little bit blurry, sorry. It's okay. And after that, the first part was to coagulate the tumor away from the attachment uh, in, in the dura. And then you see the optic nerve was identified. The supraclinoid ICA was identified. And then we were just mobilizing the tumor away from those two structures. We couldn't yet see the oculomotor nerve. So we just dissected away from the two, of the, from the carotid and from the optic nerve on the left side. And then we went ahead and put the bulk that tumor and then dissected also from the middle fossa temporal lobe. With for the tumor dissection, we, we're going to start to see the oculomotor nerve at the bottom of the tumor, but that's going to be better appreciated uh, later on in the video. And one thing uh, here is that uh, Dr. Q highlighted during during surgery, the optical carotid triangle here, and then the carotid oculomotor triangle here that you can see between the nerve and the carotid. Okay. So you see with the pre temporal extension, we had a better control of, uh, of the temporal pole. And uh, then uh, it becomes, I would say, I mean, you still have to find the MCA, but after that, the, the tumor is basically dead, the vascular rise, and then we can proceed with mobilization and coagulation of the tumor. To find this plane between the arachnoid and the vascular and the tumor is mandatory, so you can dissect that safely. And you see here, this is uh, Dr. Q uh, doing some very nice debulking of the tumor. And here we found the MCA distally. We're going to communicate with the ICA proximally and then further mobilize this tumor away from the MCA branches.
Dr. Almeida, a quick question to this, Dr. Gupta. How do you how do you address the perforators coming out of the MC at that point? So basically, uh, at that time, like you see that this is a, a virgin surgery, so first time surgery. So the plants are better preserved. The, the technique usually you go from the big vessels to the small vessels, but in that area, we didn't really have to deal with lenticular striate perforators, which were coming from the superior medial aspect of the MCA. So that's, that's easier for us. But basically, you find a plane in the most safer area of the tumor. You can coagulate and dissect the arachnoid away from the tumor toward the, the major vessel, the MCA. And uh, since this is the first surgery, usually that plane. Uh, if you preserve carefully the arachnoid plane, the vessels will be protected on the other side of the plane. So okay. basically, that's that's uh, a technique that you can use to preserve those branches. So here, um, they're um, removing the tumor capsule from the yes. temporal so you saw there, Paola showed the gross part of the tumor being removed. And here we're removing the attachments to the, uh, basically to the anterior faucet dura, and then just removing as much as we could towards the distal dura ring and then up to canal. After that was done, we just removed that entire segment of dura that contained disease uh, to maximize the tumor resection. And then uh, the resection of the tumor component of the surgery was completed. And then, of course, the reconstruction, it's a very important issue. The one thing that was that helped us in this case is that the object strut and the interclinate were not pneumatized, which is always a bit of an issue. And you have to be very attentive of that. Uh, this week, we had another one like this that it was pneumatized. And then in that case, uh, we usually recommend to use a muscle graft with surge cell and some fibrin glue and to pay attention to CSF leaks afterward. But in the case, we didn't have that, so we just used Biodesign, uh, the Institute, and in fiber and glue. Sorry. Z. Overlay uh, dural reconstruction. And then uh, Dr. Goyal and Dr. Delmeida put um, the bone back in and closing anatomical layers. Thank you, Dr. Delmeida. And this is one paper uh, that Dr. Almeida wrote and he wanted me to include uh, about the endoscopic and also transcranial approaches to the paracellular region. And we're seeing a transcranial um, approach to the posterior superior space of the cavernous sinus. Uh, Dr. Almeida, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, one? so this is, this is uh, a figure just to highlight some of the anatomical landmarks of before when you're kind of working in the actual kind of that technique which is a, you know, a classic technique, uh, but uh, the step-by-step -step is quite important. So you see on figure A, the first part was a partial peeling of the middle faucet. Uh, so the partial peeling of the lateral of the cavernous sinus that allows you to see all the way back to the tip of the middle sinus process. After that, you can debulk or you can disconnect the three points of attachment of the anterior clinoid, which are to the lateral part of the at uh, figure B, now you see uh, that which are the lateral aspect of the optic canal, OC, the optic spread, OS, and then the medial connection with the sphenoid wing, which has already been drilled at that point. So once you got that, you can basically mobilize the clinoid with careful mobilization away from the clinoid segment of the carotid and away from the aquamotor nerve, and then uh, unroof that. Uh, but uh, once again, as we said, uh, look at figure C and see that there is a black spot right in front of the clinoid ICA. That is when that is pneumatized. So you have to pay attention to that and reconstruct that carefully to minimize or to avoid CSF leaks in case of when you do the thing. Thank you, sir. So the postoperative image uh, here, you can see the axial T2 and the T1. Uh, post gadolinium and you basically see uh, inflammation of the extracranial structures, the tumor bed, post-surgical changes. And in the coronal, you can also see the post-surgical changes uh, with minimal bleeding on the tumor bed. And I wanted to include this screenshot to see that um, the vessels, we don't really see the MCA, but the vessels were this red, by radiology 
uh, to have normal uh, flow. Floyd, uh, Dr. Gupta, would you like to comment? Yeah, yeah, sure. Actually, uh, this sequence, uh, this contrast enhanced sequence that you're displaying uh, on your screen, it actually is a black blood sequence. So, I mean, I mean, obviously, it may not be possible here, but on if you take the original slices, which are actually very thin slices, one millimeter slices, and you can carefully track and on T, T, T2 is also quite helpful in trying to see the integrity of vessels in that region. And if you slowly sort of scroll through that, you can see here the MCA, the M1 trunk looks open. And, and as you go up, you can see the, you just, just above that next, you can see the branching of the MCA. And you can see here is the M2 in the sylvian fissure. So the branches look uh, uh, painted quite nicely. Thank you, sir. So the objectives of the sur surgery were achieved. Uh, no vascular lesion and also the optic nerve was preserved and uh, taken care of throughout the procedure. And this is a pathology report, Dr. Jantoft. Yes, um, this is a very classic meningioma. Um, you can see the nice meningothelial cells with the ovoid nuclei, really nothing for mitotic activity. And you can see multiple uh, meningothelial whorls. Uh, within the case. So just a very classic meningioma, um, WHO grade one. Thank you, sir. So this was the final diagnosis. Uh, the postoperative outcome was great. Uh, she had a gross oral resection of the lesion. She was sent to the uh, neuro ICU overnight uh, just to um, take care of her and uh, observation. Uh, she remained neurologically intact. Uh, she did have some left eye and swelling that could be related uh, to the manipulation of the oculomotor nerve and also to the surgery per se. Um, however, it, it is believed to be transient. The pain was well controlled. Uh, she was in Decadron and, and Kepra uh, tapers for two weeks and she was discharged in postoperative day number two. She did have a, uh, a syncopal episode uh, postoperative day number six. She went to the ED, had a head CT to rule out any bleeding. There was no bleeding. Um, the only thing that was observed in the CT was the postoperative changes, and it was related to some of the anemia and the um, hematologic um, diseases that she had. However, she did see Dr. De Almeida the day after, uh, just to um, confirm that she was fine. She was neurologically intact and doing well postoperatively still with some inflammation, but that's expected. And she had some follow-up visits with Dr. Trifiletti and Dr. Q next week. And I wanted to thank all the physicians that took care of this patient and that helped with the, with the presentation. I think we're on time and uh, thank you very much. This is also the Mangorian building, but from the inside. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Excellent presentation. I'd like to open for comments if anybody would like to uh, add any comments that you know, Dr. Vargas, Dr. Hakim, uh, or, uh, or or one of the uh, team members would like to comment as well, of course. Okay, I think that uh, for the sake of time, we have, uh, and then this is a nice slide of the upcoming presentation on Monday with Priscilla Barnes-Sianis and the Monday session. Everybody's welcome and invited to participate. And uh, we would like to thank you all for coming today. And to thank you, Paula. Thank you all for the very nice cases. Have everybody a very good day. Thank you. Obrigado. <laughs>